life. It's nice to see some smiling. That's brilliant. And if I can have some, yeah, yeah, a bit of rebel rousing, that, that, that encourages me too. So it's, it's, um, it's a joint effort. We need to just encourage one another, don't we? Um, I can't get away from Ephesians. And um, a couple of weeks ago, when I was thinking about today, um, I was reading on my daily readings from Ephesians 3. And uh, I thought, this is it, isn't it, God? You're going to have to give it me because uh, it's not a particularly familiar chapter to me. But yes, um, spending time and listening. Um, and here we go. So no apologies. This was God. Um, I'm starting at verse 4. Um, and I'm reading from the message here. Verses 4 to 6. Paul is speaking. It's called the mystery of Christ. Uh, the gospel is a mystery, isn't it? But what a blessing. Wow, wow we've been singing today about the power and the blessing of the, of the gospel. And where would we be? Just totally lost without him because he's a God in vast in love and I thank him for that um, in Ephesians 3 verses 4 to 6 in the message it says as you read what I have written to you this is Paul speaking you'll be able to see for yourselves into the mystery of Christ none of our ancestors understood this only in our time. He encouraged everyone, don't get down. There's a time when God is ready to move. Um, and we need to wait that time and wait patiently and expectantly. Um, only in our time has it been made clear by God's spirit and through his holy apostles and prophets of this excuse me, of this new order. The mystery is that people who have never heard of God, that's the Gentiles, and those who have heard of him all their lives, that's the Jews, stand on the same ground before God. Praise God. They get the same offer, the same help, the same promises in Christ Jesus. The message is accessible and welcoming to everyone across the board. I like that. The gospel is free and open to each and every one of us. We need to partake of it. We need to revel in it. We need to enjoy it, this relationship that we have with Father God. It's a spiritual birth. When we give our lives to Jesus, it's a spiritual birth that takes place. And all who come to Christ, Jew or Gentile, are born of his spirit and become spiritually alive. How many of us have become spiritually alive? I'm so glad. Praise God. The spirit of God has come into my spirit and I know it and I feel it and I'm excited by what God will do as he has brought me to become spiritually alive. You know, when, when all this happens, God takes the scales off our eyes. We can't see Jesus without the scales are removed from our eyes, and that's part of the process. God removes the scales from our eyes so that we can see what's happening. And we are spiritual beings and we need to constantly see with our spiritual eyes what's going off in the spirit realm. Because there's only spiritual people that can deal with what's happening in the world at the spiritual level. That's the powerful level. That's where things get moved. That's where the action takes place in the spirit realm. And being spirit be beings, we need to know and understand that and get up there 
uh, in our authority. Um, the spirit realm is the real realm. That's where the action is. Um, and I was thinking as I was preparing this, uh, what God said to Andrew, and he said to him, everything that you see here isn't real. This was back in the 80s, I think, so I'm going to ask Andrew just to explain that. Caught me on the, caught me on the up on this one. Um, yeah, years ago when when we were in another church building, um, I was preaching and suddenly I had this open sort of impression, vision from the Lord, and uh, and he, he literally said to me, he said, the building that we were in, he said, this building's not real. And I went. Ever, ever get that when the Lord speaks to you and tells you something and you think, hey? Now bear in mind, he's, he's got a greater mind than ours. He said, this building's not real. And, and I went up to the, to the wall and I went, but it, it is, Lord. He said, no, it's not. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, in a few hundred years' time, or less than that, this building will not be here. Mm. There'll be no remembrance of it. Mm. There'll not be a sign of it. But he said, that which I do in the realm of the spirit, that is what's real. Yeah. Mm. Everything that we have around us, mm. everything that we have, is transient. The cars we have, guess what happens to them? They gradually rust and rot away, wear out, not, and we have to continue moving on. But the spirit realm, hallelujah, he's the same yesterday, mm -hmm. today, and forever. He changes not. Mm -hmm. There's no decay, there's no rust, there's nothing in the spiritual realm that will ever vanish away no. that belongs to God. And so the Lord said to me, everything that around you is transient, but me. He's fixed. Mm -hmm. He's fixed. And we need to focus on him as being the very center of all that we see and do. Because everything else can change. Yeah. And thank God it does, doesn't it? But he doesn't change. No. Our circumstances will change mm. for the better. Amen. Because if we let God be in control, they change for the better. Amen. Amen. So just remember, although we do a lot of things in this building, it's transient. But it's fulfilling a purpose. But Christ is the same. The word of God is the same. Amen. Does that, yeah, is that what you need? Yeah. It was better that Andrew shared that with us because Andrew spoke, that God spoke to him. If we think about on the road to Emmaus, there were two disciples. Um, they were walking seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus and Jesus joined them. But they didn't recognize him. Their eyes, there were scales on their eyes. They couldn't see. And uh, they were talking and chatting, chatting away. And um, Jesus, the promised Messiah, they were unable to recognize him until he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he gave it to them. And at that point, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that point, he disappeared from their sight. The communion is a mystery. It's one of God's beautiful mysteries. But when we partake of it by faith, we enter into a spiritual communion with him. And it's a powerful act. And I praise God that we continue to do that every week. And sometimes midweek, 
but it's good, it's wonderful to do that. It's a spiritual action. When you think about Saul on the Damascus Road in Acts 9, he was on his way to persecute the Christians uh, when, as we know, a bright light shone from heaven and blinded him. And he fell to his knees. And after three days, God told Ananias to go and pray for him. And he did so. And as he prayed for him, guess what? The scales fell off his eyes. And he recognized the gospel. He recognized Jesus. Saul, who became later Paul, was God's chosen vessel to preach the gospel of the good news to the Gentiles who in the process would suffer much. Seeing in the invisible is really crucial in these days. Seeing behind the facade and what's going on. We are spiritual people, our spirit is born again and we need to rise to that spiritual level of hearing what's really going on in the world where the action is happening in these days. Um, if you look at verses 7 and 8, the uh, first part of 8 in the message, Paul said, this is my life's work, helping people understand to respond to this message. It came as a sheer gift to me, a real surprise. God handling all the details. When he came to presenting the message to the people who had no background in God's way, I was the least qualified of any of all the available Christians. God saw to it that I was equipped, but you can be sure that it had nothing to do with my natural abilities. Amazing that God chose Paul, because what was he? A scholar of legalism. <laughs> and God said to him, go and give him the message of grace. Go and preach the gospel of grace to the Gentiles and to the Jews. Well, he wanted to persecute the Jews who had become Christians and he hated the Gentiles. But you know, when, he, when the scales came off his eyes, there was a true conversion and his whole man was changed, his spirit was changed and everything else was changed. His, his outlook, his heart, it was a powerful thing that happened to him. It, it was the power of the grace of God. A spiritual transformation had taken place. Um, and it was a sheer gift. And those he calls, he equips. So that puts us all on a level playing field, doesn't it? You know, you, it's no good saying to God, it, um, I can't do that. It's nothing to do with your natural ability. If he's called you to do something, he'll equip you to do that. All he needs you to say is, I believe you, I'll step out, I'll do it, God, because I hear your voice. And there's a need, obviously. You know, sometimes we, we get in our comfort zone uh, and we say, oh, that's not me, I, I couldn't possibly do it. I mean, I never thought I'd stand up here. That's not me, I couldn't possibly do that. But God said, it's not, no excuse. I've called you by faith, trust me, step out, move with me, do what I'm asking you to do. That's what spiritual people do. They respond at the level of the spirit, not at the level of the flesh. Amen? We're a spirit people. Verses 8 to 10 in the message says, Paul is saying, so here I am, preaching and writing about things that are way over my head. The inexhaustible riches and generosity of Christ. My task is to bring out in the open and make plain what God, who created all of this in the first place, has been doing in secret and behind the scenes all along. Through followers of Jesus like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about, even among the angels, this extraordinary plan. An exciting plan. I get excited. The, the NLT says it this way. Through the church, through us, the power of his spirit and his manifold wisdom in its rich variety, the operating 
of many spiritual gifts. Are you away? Hello, hello. The operating of many spiritual gifts in the church, in the body, flowing by the spirit, listening to the spirit realm. And by doing that as a body, as we operate in the many and varied gifts that God has given us, we are revealing to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms that we know what's happening. We stand in authority over them. They are under our feet. The church rules. Christ rules with his church, even at this point. It's spiritual battle and Religion won't cut it. We know that, don't we? I don't hate people who think I'm religious. I'm not. A life to the Spirit is what is necessary. So listening to the Holy Spirit and following his instruction, his instruction will bring down the wicked spiritual. We have the authority in his name to do it. It's our responsibility. And we need, as a spiritual people, to take our spiritual authority in the spirit realm. Amen. I was, I think a couple of days later, after I really felt God was saying this to me, I was reading Matthew 25, and, and that's quite a challenging chapter. There are three parables there that I think are very relevant to this generation. The, the first parable is the five wise and the five foolish virgins. I think back to, to my younger days when there were so many who were brought up to love God and accepted him as a saviour, but they wanted him on their terms. Mm. These are what I look at as the foolish virgins. We can't have God on our terms. It's his terms. And they wanted to be out doing business. They wanted to be looking after their own interests. Instead of being full of the spirit of God, remaining in his house and giving light to the world and becoming men and women who discerned the times. Being spiritually aware of where we're at and what's happening. And in verse 12, the, Jesus says of those foolish virgins, Do I know you? No, I don't think I do. Does God know you? He knows me. And I'm so glad I know him. There's relationship there. And it's crucial to me. It's life to me. This spirit man is so alive. I can't get enough. I want more, more, more. And that's a spirit that's alive to God. The second parable was investing in the kingdom. We've got a responsibility to invest the talents that God has given us in God's kingdom and into the lives of others. You know, if we hide our treasure, we'll lose it. And we'll also lose our place in God's kingdom. That's what happened to the man who buried his talent. And we don't want that said of us. We have a huge responsibility to spread the good news to those who God brings across our path. The third one, Jesus was talking about the sheep and the goats. And on his return, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. It, it reads this way. Then the king will say to the sheep, Enter, you who are blessed by my father. Take what's coming to you in his kingdom. It's been ready for you since the foundation of the world. And here's why. You, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then those sheep will reply, Well, when did we do these things? And Jesus said, 
Then the king will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, you did it to me. Similarly, Jesus goes on to say, he will speak to the goats, but as to why they didn't respond as the sheep did. And his reply will be, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. In his judgment, the sheep go into eternal life. The goats go away into eternal punishment. The very sobering words that Jesus gave those words in Matthew 25. And I don't want to walk a narrow line. I want to be all in for God. And that's where God wants us. And in the last few days, as we know, the organ's been removed. In the next few months, the extension goes ahead. God's making the building practical for reaching out to this community. Are we ready for the challenge to carry out God's mandate for the community in which he's placed us? I believe if we're not, we have a real desire to be there and to get to it. And I think there'll be some big surprises when we start. <laughs> But I thank God that the fields are white unto harvest. And we need to be praying now that the Lord brings workers into the harvest field. Amen. Verses 11 to 13 in the message, it carries on. All this is proceeding along lines planned all along by God and then executed in Christ Jesus. When we trust in him, we're free to say whatever needs to be said. We're bold to go wherever we need to go. So don't let my present trouble on your behalf get you down. Be proud. I, I love, as we've sung, here is love vast as the ocean. This love like mighty rivers flowed <coughs> incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world. He gave us all a huge, I love you. Not a fickle love, not an emotional love, but a heartfelt, spiritual love. And because of Christ, we can come boldly into God's presence and confidently. I love on, in John 15, I love reading that chapter where he fully explains, I am in him and he is in me. We're inseparable. I'm there for life, folks, I'm telling you. There's no um, doubt in my mind. I belong to him and he belongs to me. And I am in him. Romans 8 says he's the firstborn among many brothers. And in verse 29, um, it says, we are all firstborn sons and inheritors of the blessings. We are co-heirs with Christ. What authority we have over all the works of the devil. He's under our feet. And you know what? The devil lives in fear of the church finding out who she is. Amen? Well, for we who understand who we are and where the devil is, he needs to know that we know. Amen? So let's let him know at every opportunity that we're in charge, not him. Paul was undergoing trials and suffering for the gospel, but his attitude was one of rejoicing and encouraging the Ephesians to rejoice in the rich extravagance of God's love, irrespective of circumstances. Paul wasn't sat there. He was in prison. He wasn't sat there uh, bemoaning his lot. He was not saying, oh, woe is me. Woe is me. What have I done to deserve this? God doesn't love me. No, no, no. We also will go through troubles and challenges. 
That's what makes us strong. If we never had a problem, we would never know that God could solve them, as they say. And adversity is not there to break us, but to make us. And it surely has formed character in me and will continue to do so, I know. Verse 14 um, to 19, Paul says, this is his prayer, my response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. And I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. He's a gentleman. He will not push his way through. He stands at the door. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And there's only a handle on one side. It's the inside. You have to open it. And he will come in. And so the relationship begins. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly, on love. You'll be able to take in with all the followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth, test its length, plumb the depths and rise to the heights. Live a full life, full in the fullness of God. That's where we need to be, living full lives, carefree going about our business because God's gone ahead of you. He's prepared the way and he's given you all the authority that you will ever need. And I was looking up um, actually uh, the four dimensions of God's love that are mentioned here. And, and there were some interesting things there. It's, it's broad. So that means it embraces everyone regardless of race, age or occupation. He's the friend of sinners. Thank you, Jesus. He's my friend. The length, the length that God went to in expressing his love by sending his son to be our saviour. The cost to God was immense. Truly it was. I don't think we realise the pain that it put God through to see Jesus suffer in the way that he did. Any natural father would really suffer how much more spiritual his love extends to those who hated him didn't he he wasn't partial he loved all Romans 5 and verse 8 says but God demonstrates his own love in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us he saw ahead he saw you and me down the corridors of time taking him as Lord and Saviour. The depth of his love, it extends to the depths of human need. There's hope for us all in Christ, regardless of the shameful depth to which we may have descended. God's love can reach and transform them. When we've worked with the druggies on the streets, and you see how low they've become, and yet there's hope. <coughs> For them. There's hope for all of us. And I thank God that he saves, what was that saying? Saves from the uttermost to the guttermost. He saves all. His love is the same to each of us. Yeah, there's some shameful deeds to which men have descended, but God's love reaches down to them. And the height of his love, it raises men from a horrible pit to heavenly places. <laughs> He's lifted me up into heavenly places and his banner over me is love. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the rush heap, rubbish heap. He sets him with princes and makes them inherit a throne of glory. That's 1 Samuel verses 2. With an all-encompassing love like that, we're totally free to live full lives, free of all condemnation, enjoying the liberty in which Christ has set us free. Amen. 
why would you want to go into the world and and no I'm not saying what I think but you know why do you want to descend as low to get into the world and do what they do and well it just didn't even enter my head verses 20 and 21 God can do anything you know far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams and he does it not by pushing us around but by working within us his spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God forever, says Paul. And I was talking to, um, to Joda the other day and, and I was thinking about him when I was writing this. God can do anything, you know. He doesn't do it by pushing us around or, but, and giving us a, rule, a list of rules that we've got to keep. And if we don't keep them, it's out. That's not God. He knows that we, we are weak and we'll fall. He's made provision for all of that. But he says, I, I know everything that's going to happen to you. From the moment you were born, I saw you. I knew when I'd called you. I knew you'd be mine. And I have arms open, ready to receive you. So he works within us. How? By his spirit, he works deeply and gently within us. We need to be in the, in the word of God because that's where the powerful force, it's a spiritual book and it speaks to our spirit. The two connect and there you begin to feel and experience who God is and how much he's there for you. In Christ, we lack nothing. We've nothing to lose and we've nothing to fear. We have all the fullness of, just think about this a minute. We have all the fullness of God available to us. Wow. Huh? They dwell in us. We are complete in him, baby. Yeah. You know, we need to just sit and meditate on some of these passages in scripture and it will just explode in your spirit because <laughs> it's a spiritual book we have all the fullness of God to us as we remain in communion with him with a relationship and authority beyond our wildest dreams it cost Jesus everything but it was the father's delight to do it that he might see his sons and daughters living in fullness let's not disappoint God let's live to the full measure that he's given to us to enjoy to revel in him he revels in you revel in him love him tell him get close to him snuggle up to him have a picture of yourself sat in his arms Andrew used to, I've said it before but Andrew used to have a, his favorite chair I've just phoned that he's looking at me a bit disgusted but it got worse it got worse for wear and I was sick of seeing it so off it went to the pit but Andrew said to me that was my place where I snuggled on God's knee uh, and it's replacement is not a snuggle chair so I'm sorry we'll have to <laughs> sort it out we all need a snuggle chair where we can snuggle up to God Charlie loves to snuggle up to us when we sit down we need to do that with God. It's also important that we stay in contact with other believers. It's crucial that the body of Christ comes together because here is spiritual power. And those who is isolate themselves from God's family and try to live their lives alone, they cut themselves off from much of God's power. This is the powerhouse. This is the power source. We all bring our anointing. We all come together and when we all bring our anointing and we're all listening and we're all tuned into the spirit, wow, guess what happens? We take off, don't we? Literally take off. But we don't, we need to let go of inhibitions, just get so absorbed with him and follow him. When he says, Grace, do this. When your spirit's screaming at you, come on, come on. 
do it. Do it. When we shall see him mighty, great and powerful for it. 1 John 4 and verse 17 says, As he is, so are we in this world. Are we doing it? <laughs> we're having a we're sort of dipping our toes in it aren't we and coming away and then going back and having another go but come on folks let's make a point of we can do what God says we can do we can be who God says we are and we need to just line up with him and let our spirit just soar with him and, and forget about yourself concentrate on him and worship him and you'll start stepping out and doing things that you're not even aware you're doing because you're so taken up with the spirit realm and what Jesus wants to do. Um, the last part here is, uh, Andy might want to finish this off again, but a friend of ours at that time, um, she used to have epilepsy and... Uh, they live, they live not too far from us and um, I believe Andrew spent some time praying with him. But he was sharing quite a lot of the sort of thing that I'm sharing with you today. And, and she was very sceptical. And when he'd finished, she said somewhat sarcastically, you think you're a little Jesus, don't you? And Andrew thought about it for a minute and he said, yes, I do. Well, she exploded. <laughs> but we do. We are a little Jesus. And all the fullness of God dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and quickens your mortal body. So, yes, we are little Jesuses. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely true. We are. As he is, so are we in this world. Let's live it. Truly, let's live it. Andrew published um, a little booklet. It was all about um, prayers and confessions from the word of God that are really powerful. And one of them is from Ephesians 1. And I'd like us all to stand um, and just follow me on this one. We'll say it all together. Just two, two, three verses from Ephesians 1. It's from verses 17, 18, and 19. This is our prayer. So let's all, if this is your heart, do it with me. Think about what you're saying. I pray that the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of my understanding may be enlightened so that I will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Amen. Amen. That's my prayer. That's my, the cry of my heart. And I pray it's yours and God will respond to that cry as we pray and believe and receive. Amen.